Bang! Yay! Everybody grab a seat. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for coming again and um, let's get started. I, I, this, this electrification and, and grid stuff is a really, really big deal. And we got two gentlemen that um, are, well, when you hear them, you'll understand why they're, why, why, why they're here. All right, well, without further ado, please take over and tell us about electrification, grid, um, a little bit of your back. He crossed to the dark side. He was an engineer and became an architect. My freaking God. <laughs> Well, next thing you're going to do, you're going to have a, you know, an MD becoming an architect. What the heck is... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Carry on, gentlemen. Thank you. Warm welcome. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, actually worse than an architect, so I did real estate development and then was a lobbyist for a couple of years, so <laughs> don't kill me. Um, so resource efficient electrification, REE, or decarbonization, RED. Actually, New York State is kind of flip-flopping on the word because electrification triggers people. I mean, it really does. It can piss people off, that word. Uh, and I can't quite understand why. I think it's like, are we electrocuting people? Like, what, what exactly? But I think it's because it kind of harkens back to the 70s, right? Like, when everything was going to be electric, and we are going to have nuclear power, and everything was going to be wonderful. And we built really freaking ugly buildings that sucked. So electrification triggers people, so maybe we shouldn't say it. Um, yeah. So what are we going to talk about? A lot of different things. Um, seemingly random things, but there's a common thread. Uh, we're kind of going to go all over the place. Hopefully you could follow along. If you can't, stand up, ask a question. Seriously, you can in interrupt us, ask a question, okay? Um, we're going to talk about how gas might phase out, right? How do we make buildings more grid interactive, high performing, because that in reality is a capacity resource in a high electrification scenario. So all the things that you guys do uh, is ultra important, but policymakers don't know that. So you have to be louder. <laughs> you have to speak more loudly to policymakers. Um, and so we're going to talk about inside the building and outside the building uh, and what things might happen you know, between those two, two efforts on a district scale and then also inside the buildings. And just so you know about more about me, I, I've mostly worked with very large buildings, so like a million square feet, New York City. Um, I don't know that I have a ton in common with most people in this room, uh, but you know, managing like 200 buildings for extremely rich people and trying to get them to understand what decarbonization even was. Uh, so over the course of 10 years, I finally got them to get it, um, realized that it was basically just asset management, improving the building, make the building more high performing so that they could sell it for more money and potentially borrow against it uh, you know, at lower rates and get more money. So I mean, it's basically that. So I'm just going to move on here. Do you sure. want to talk about this? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm Mark Klingen. I work at Integral Energy. Um, and uh, my background is that I'm not anywhere close to a building science person. So um, please, please excuse that. Uh, I've been in the energy markets for about 35 years. Um, buying, selling, trading uh, natural gas and electricity, um, doing procurement, uh, testifying at state commissions on lots of different utility and, and uh, energy issues, um, that kind of thing. Testified at, at, at FERC and, and did dynamic removal of a very large aluminum plant. A lot of different, uh, a lot of different stuff in my background. Um, and currently, I, uh, I teach at Penn State in the Renewable Energy Systems and Sustainability Program. Uh, I teach a couple of courses on, uh, on policy and a couple of courses on uh, solar project management and finance. Um, and I work on, on these decarbonization issues, uh, coming at it from the energy market side and, and particularly from the, the natural gas side. Um, what I'll say too is that um, I've given this talk a lot, and so I've heard it a lot, and it's boring to me. Uh, 
Jared's not boring to me, but I've heard Jared <laughs> talk a lot too. It's boring. It's boring. And to be brutally honest, the way that we'd like to do this is we'd much, much prefer to have a dialogue than stand up here and run through a set of slides. How many people have seen this? A lot of people, right? No? Yes? No? Raise your hand. If you've seen it, raise your hand. We all have now. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, it's that kind of crowd. All right. That's good. All right. Excellent. No, and, and please shout that stuff out because, on, honest to God, this will work way better if you guys are asking us questions than us sitting up here spewing this stuff out. It, re it, it really will. Um, you're, you're smart and you know what you want to talk about. But, but um, you know, to get get beyond all, beyond all that. Um, this really is kind of the truth of where we're at in the decarbonization story. Right? We can talk about electrifying transportation and Elon Musk and Rivian and those guys. You know, eye on batteries. What's that? Right, yeah. They, 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 they've kind of got that. They, they can electrify the grid. Oh, somebody's taking a picture. That's cool. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think we're going to make the, make the slides available at the end, too. Um, but, uh, you know, Electrifying the grid, you know, we kind of understand that. We've been trying to do that for the last 10, 15 years. Oh, wind, solar, you know, other kind of stuff. But this heating thing is a real issue. It's a, it's, 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 it's a real issue. How to get to it is, is a real issue. And so you have, you know, all these guys are talking about all this stuff, and then you've got energy security and climate goals, and the elephant in the room is, boom, heating. How, how, do, how do we handle this? It might be Vladimir Putin, too. I'm sorry? Vladimir Putin's kind of the elephant in the room. Well, it, 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 this, is, this, is, this is really the elephant in the room today. I, I, the, um, I mean, I'm, I'm in the gas market and uh, on a regular basis and, and basically we, we got back down to five bucks a million and now it's 760 today. Right, this the volatile, and that's just in a month, right? We're at seven, down to five, back to back to seven sixty, seven seventy today. You know, it was trading about two years ago. A dollar. Two bucks. Yeah. Okay. So that's 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 the world that we're in, and five, ten years ago, we wouldn't care about this in North America. But now, because we've built a whole bunch of LNG facilities where this can now go to other places, all commodities, as you know, seek the highest price they can get, right? That's why all the producers wanted to build all this stuff to get the, get the gas out of North America and off to Berlin or other places, right? Because people will pay more for this there. They're not paying seven bucks in, in, in Germany, I can guarantee you that. You know, if they could turn around the Everett LNG plant, they, they would, they could make more money. Right. Like why, why sell to Boston, really? Yeah. Exactly, and Boston's the highest price, and Boston is the highest, highest price gas in all of North America, right? We're number one. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> But as, as, I tell, as I tell my students, I say, you know, low-cost gas was a really good thing for renewables, and they say, why? Because you're forced to be competitive. High-cost gas is a really good thing for renewables, too, because it gives us headroom to, to, to do the kinds of things that, that, that need to be done, uh, because an MMBTU is now transferable, whether you're saving it or, or, or burning it. So I'll turn it back, turn it over to Jared. Yeah, so the climate thing, right? I mean, we all know about it. Um, New York passed a pretty groundbreaking law called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. I could talk about New York. I lived in, in Boston for a while, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm rather going to talk about New York. <laughs> uh, the CLCPA basically mandates grid decarbonization by 2040. Everyone rolls their eyes when we say that, but there's a whole hell of a lot of offshore wind coming. I mean, there's leases that have been signed. You know, this stuff is coming. They're building wind ports in Brooklyn and Albany. They're going to use the Hudson River as a marine highway. Uh, it's pretty tremendous what's going on. And not to mention everything that's going on off the coast of New Jersey. Um, you know, and all those guys want to sell power into New York, too. So that they might actually bypass transmitting to New Jersey. They might just go into Zone J in New York because it's pretty high, high cost power. Um, they're also mandating uh, economy-wide decarbonization by 2050. Um, so pretty, you know, pretty big effort. You know, we're seeing we're seeing similar policy emerge in Massachusetts. So everybody's looking at New York, other states, and they will copy it. I mean, sorry, that's what we we export crazy things. Um, 
So New York City passed the CMA, or the Climate Mobilization Act. It's New York City Local Law 97. It actually puts caps you know, on emissions from buildings over 25,000 square feet. Uh, and then for every ton of CO2 emitted above that cap, you're paying a fine. Um, there's a gas ban in new construction. So New York City did the gas ban for large buildings. It's going to trickle down to small buildings. Um, and the state uh, actually had legislation kind of on the table. They were ready to pass the same thing. It kind of went down in a ball of flames, and I can maybe talk to that a little bit. Um, I could also talk about what legislation replaced that. Go, go ahead. Mike's not working, so I'll talk loudly. Okay. You see these kind of numbers, 20, 40, 20, 50, the people that are doing this, that are really dead. Yeah. When you say, hey, hey, you guys, take care of that. Yeah, you right? deal so, with it, yeah. But the reality is, what will happen in uh, 2038? Right. right. That's but to me, I'm like, well, we're not backtracking it. So you're going to get there by then. We're not making the steps right. really now to get there. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, we got plenty of time to do this. So I don't see really the, the hardcore changes right. that have to happen to get to that level. And I, I will probably won't be there in 2038. But it's going to be really nobody uses anything. Is what you're after. It's like, okay, we're going to get there because everything is shut off. So you know, and the and the governor of New York just announced two million carbon neutral homes, right? Like within a really short period of time, you know, without a real and they're they're doing roadmaps, like constantly roadmap, roadmap. They're everybody's doing a roadmap, and. Uh, there's very little understanding about the continuum, like the spectrum of change, and like what is the first step, right? And what that does is it kind of undermines the entire conversation, right? The entire conversation just gets undermined, and people go crazy, and they go to the extremes, and they fight. I mean, sound familiar? It's like everything that we do today. Um, so in reality, we need some middle ground. We have to have a common language between all of us to talk about this stuff uh, to make sure that you know we are identifying what the proper next step is, and then what the next step after that and what's the first step that nobody's taking. Exactly, is understanding what the steps are. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to assume that you guys know a lot about what you're going to talk about and that I'm hoping that we will restrain our questions enough to let you tell us what you know that you think we Thank should you. know. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so that was Mark saying everybody shut up. So these are, <laughs> these are the emissions limits. Um, tons of CO2 equivalent per square foot. The equivalent is you know, converting all the origin source energy into the building over to KBTU or CO2 equivalent. Um, you know, converting energy use intensity over to CO2 equivalent. Uh, using fixed numbers. So the law doesn't even have numbers that change, which is so stupid. It's so dumb. Um, we could talk about the next slide. Uh, and so, you know, you go through this whole, uh, you know, calculation, and you figure out all the different use types inside the building. If you have a big uh, mixed-use building, you're identifying what the emissions cap for that particular use group is. There's a giant list. It's not just these three. There's like this whole huge list, um, and then you identify what the annual emissions cap is. Right, and if you're over that, you're paying 268. Sure. Yep. So they, they, <laughs> you should probably wait until they you present can, something. Handle it. <laughs> Go ahead. Are they fixing the amount of CO2 per unit of gas and electricity over, yeah. over the whole period? It's so stupid. All right, we'll talk about that. <laughs> And you know where they're getting it from, too? Like EPA, which is like in arrears by three years. So it's uh, like, yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, so there it is. Like, that's the top line. I think that's the most important one. The other ones are real numbers. But the top line is for Zone J, New York, ISO, um, Zone J plus Westchester. And that's an EPA number. And there's no like forward look. So now we're in rulemaking. I'm participating in rulemaking for this law. And I've been arguing since the beginning that, look, we need to tell everybody what that coefficient is all the way out to zero. Like, we have to show people or no one can plan for it. No one's planning for this because they, they don't believe this. And you're not making a commitment. So if the state made a commitment to 2040, draw a straight line. I don't care what the line looks like, right? It could be like a, a you know declining curve. Or draw a straight line and let people know. Because what do asset managers do? They determine the net present value of their decisions over a long period of time. So we have to tell people what the grid coefficient is going to be from now until 
2040, which should be zero, right? If you're really gonna commit to it, give people zero. So now there's this whole nuanced conversation around like, we shouldn't be penalizing building owners for what the grid does. Sure, great, thank you. So, but we have to get that through the whole sausage making process and actually implement that, which is gonna be insane. <laughs> Con Edison is now even talking about carbon neutral steam. I mean, you've heard the same thing from vicinity in Boston. Carbon neutral steam, like what does that mean? Well, there's probably gonna be offsets involved and they're even talking about electric resistance boilers. So like, great, let's blow up the grid faster. That's good. Um, you wanna talk about this one? Shh, no, go ahead, this, right. this, is, this is in your wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, everybody knows this. We don't have to talk about this. Okay. I'm not gonna talk about that. You need to talk about that, I don't know what that, that is. <laughs> right, I mean, everybody knows this one too, right? Like. We're gonna have the same buildings pretty much in 100 years, okay. Yeah, we're at, like the whole world's not gonna be a Detroit. I hope not, right? If we're doing that, then we're gonna fry ourselves just by the embedded emissions and all the construction materials that we'll use to rebuild the entire country. Like, not gonna happen at all. In fact, what are they showing? I put a little arrow that says demolition. Two houses out of all of those houses will be demolished and replaced, right? Um, so, you know, we're not building new things. Like, we're just not. Yeah, burn, flood, yeah, that, that's what we'll take that out, yeah. Ooh. Um, so yeah, that's it, right? We gotta, we gotta start doing this now in existing buildings. So what signals, what policies can we create? What can we do to start accelerating this thing? How do we reduce costs, right? Everybody talks about this all the time. You wanna talk about this one? Sure, Okay. sure, so um, a lot of folks know about what a a a ASHPs are. I learned about three years ago that they're air source heat pumps. And apparently they use a lot of electricity, which a lot of people like, um, but what we rely on now to meet heating peaks is this really, really cool commodity called natural gas. And, and I live in Pennsylvania, and the middle sixth of the state is basically the entire deliverability for the entire East Coast. Okay, that's where all the natural gas storage comes from. So when you say, hey, it went to 20 degrees today, where'd my gas come from? It came from thermal the middle storage. sixth of Pennsylvania. It's, that's thermal storage. Chemical that's what thermal, thermal storage, storage looks like, right? Is natural gas comes when it needs to come through line pack and it comes out of, out of storage, which is du just depleted old gas reservoirs. It brings it up and, and, it trans and, and that gas gets transported to load centers like Boston, New York, and, and, and Philadelphia. So if we go to air source heat pumps, what, what happens here is this is what, what we've termed the falcon curve. Now, maybe you folks have seen the duck curve in, uh, in California, right? So you know what the duck curve is? I mean, basically, it looks like a duck. You've got a duck's back. You've got this thing that comes you know, down during the middle of the day and then goes up. At solar the, generation. Right? Yeah, because of solar generation. It comes down in the middle of the day because you know, all the sun's out and, and you know, there's not a lot of load. And then at 5 o'clock, it shoots up like a duck's back because the sun's going down and everybody's turning on their air conditioning because they're coming home. So that's that's the duck curve. This is this is what we've termed the falcon curve because it's this is across a year. So this is January. We didn't come up with that. Sorry. No, it's not, it's, it, it's not ours. Um, but but we stole it. Fair and square. Um, but also, it's, like, it's, it's, it's going to take flight. It's in terawatt hours. Like why are we why are we talking about it? it it's like obscuring the real problem. Right. Well, and we'll get we'll get to why this obscures the real problem. But this is but this this does illustrate this from a from a purely graphical perspective as to what would happen if we went air source heat pumps in the wintertime. This is what's gonna happen to the grid. That, that big line there that looks like a falcon, right? Okay, the head's in the middle, that's the summertime, that's what the, that's what the electric peak looks like, okay? But then if you go air source heat pump, what happens is in the wintertime, you consume more and more and more terawatt hours of electricity, and that's going to tax the grid from a commodity perspective in a huge way. So you could see this increase, you know, by by 60 percent. Now, the real issue is what happens to the peak. 
Okay, and what happens to the peak when air source heat pumps start to start to uh, uh, work at lower and lower temperatures is the peak goes up 300 percent. Okay, I will concede that that dotted line can move. Okay, for the air source heat pump people in the room, uh, they they don't go into resistance at 30, 25 degrees. Okay, fine, right? That can move. We should be trying to push it as far to the left as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, in, in any event, you know what, what we really concern ourselves with when we build out these systems is is, is demand. Commodity is fine, but demand is what really matters, right? And so that demand, and and I've run numbers on this personally, McKinsey. Runs, has run numbers on it as well. There are a lot of folks out there. And basically what they're saying is, if we electrify and don't do anything about that thermal storage piece, what's going to happen is we're going to have a threefold jump okay, in the summer peak to serve the winter. And this is in you know, uh, regions like New York, PJM, uh, ISO New England, Midwest ISO. Okay, so that's a 300% increase. We can't handle it on the distribution system. We can't handle it on the transmission system, and we certainly don't have the peaking electric resources to handle. It. That's a controversial statement. I know, right? No, it's not. No, it's not. Everybody fight. Get your nines out. It's controversial. It is controversial, right? I've never had a manufacturer like really reveal to me how it's operating, and then I put them in, and then we meter it, and we realize like. It's not really operating the way that they say it is. Um, so I don't know what to believe. Whatever. Like zero, cool. That's great. Like let's get to zero. Let's figure that out. I think design integration is really, really, really important. Right? Like thinking about the whole to get that thing to actually operate the way that it's supposed to. And then at the same time, like we shouldn't be asking it to do things that it can't do. It's so like not all of them operate at zero. Right, so we have to be cognizant of that. Um, so I guess what we're arguing is in a high electrification scenario, high performance buildings, good design integration, heat networks, and we'll talk about that, are electric capacity. Right, if we don't have gas anymore to be capacity, we have to come up with something else. It's also not like a 100% flip, like we don't have gas anymore, we have to do this all at once. Like that's not what this is, right? I'm talking about a 30 year transition. And where do you start? Like what's the first step? Um, so we really need to be driving COPs up and these are holistic COPs, like integrating heat pumps with thermal storage, right? Integrating multiple types of heat pumps so that we're not asking a heat pump to do something it wasn't designed to do. We can have multiple heat pumps in a building that talk to each other. That can happen, right? So I think like we need to be more nuanced with how we speak to people that don't understand this stuff um, because they're coming up with like really bad policy. <laughs> so we have to be more vocal and we need to be more clear about what we mean when we talk about decarbonization and electrification. So I don't think air source heat pumps are bad. They're not. Like they're a big piece of the puzzle. Think about how often it is zero degrees Fahrenheit or even 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like very, like not often, <laughs> right? I mean, everywhere in North America, it's not often, I mean, I won't count Alaska, right? But everywhere in, in North America is not often 20 degrees. I'm sorry, Minneapolis has $3,000 a year where it's freezing. But it's not like 50% of the time, is it? $3,000. It's not 50%. Yeah. 8,800. But is it 20 or is it 31? I mean, be more specific about the bins. Like, what do the bins look like? $3,000 below freezing. Below freezing. My quick math, you know, is that's at least a third. But it's still not all the time. It's still not all the time. But guess what? I have to heat when it's freezing. Yeah. Figure that out. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> that's your job. I think we could burn energy studies. <laughs> Can I ask for a quick definition? Can you tell us what a thermal network is? I don't know. What yeah, we're going to talk about that. Oh. Yep. Um, one more question. Back there. 
gentleman back. What, what I'm suggesting is that we should we should okay. be hybridizing. Like hybridization is not a bad word. Okay, it's not a bad word. It, we need to do it, and we need to do it now. We need to ask heat pumps to operate when they're meant to operate and hybridize. Even bad ones can operate generally okay if they're not asked to do what they can't do, right? So hybridization is not a bad thing. Some activists think it's a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing because we have to get people to move now. The right? emissions reduced today are better than the emissions reduced later. Right, I think that's a really important point. Um, so there's, there are these like mental traps, right, that we fall into, and then we start to argue, right, that we can do like one-to-one -one swap outs. The activists are just like, oh, let's just electrify the building and, and swap a steam boiler for something, like a resistance boiler. <laughs> let's cut holes in the facade and put in PTHPs for the entire, you know, 400 unit multifamily building. It's okay, like, let's just do that. And it's not, there's not the way to be thinking about this. Like, with it, ignoring the envelope, right? Ignoring windows, they've got 40 year old windows that don't operate and the clasp doesn't even work and we're just gonna put PTHPs in. You know, it's not, that's not okay, right? Like, we can have a nuanced conversation about this and we can get those activists come al to come along if we can speak their language a little bit better. We just have to change how we speak about this stuff. Um, so doing everything at once is just, that is not within the purview of most real estate owners. Like, unless you get this giant capital infusion, which sometimes happens if you're repositioning a really large office building and you need to vacate the building and or there's a natural disaster, you know, but those things don't happen that often, right? Like you generally have buildings that are fully occupied or mostly occupied and you have to figure out how to transition that thing over time, right? It's over time. I think that's like the real critical thing here. And I think for a lot of you, you're like, well, what is he saying that's new? But for most people out there, they don't, they're not thinking about this. They just think about like switching over. It's like, do you remember when you didn't have a smartphone? And then all of a sudden we have a smartphone? No, like it didn't happen like that, you know? Cities don't change and just flip to some new technology. They slowly change over time. And in between, it's freaking messy and crazy and people make lots of mistakes. So we're in that, right? We're gonna be in that for a long time. Um, optimizing just around simple payback. I'm sure you've all like banged your head against the wall for owners that just want to do that. They don't think about net present cost. They don't think about business as usual cost or the cost of inaction. Um, you know, comparing life expectancy, exactly. So you've got a boiler coming up in two years, right? Are you, what are you planning to do? Right, if you put it in and it's got a you know, 30 year, or if it's a big steam boiler, it's a 50 year life, like are you gonna have gas in 50 years? Are you gonna own the building? That's the other problem too, is what's the length of ownership? So maybe they don't care. But if you put the steam boiler back in and then you are gonna sell in 10 years and then all of a sudden the banks are putting a price on carbon and they're not lending to people that have bad equipment, which is coming. You know, doesn't that hurt? So people are only just starting to think about this stuff right now. Let me go to the next slide. So inside buildings, right? I mean, everybody knows this. It's energy efficiency, it's demand reduction, thermal storage equals demand reduction in most cases. Um, enabling the potential for thermal energy network connections, fossil fuel phase out, and then developing something like a thermal dispatch model for all of those pieces of equipment that go in the building. And I'm generally thinking about like very complex buildings, right? I'm not talking about single family houses here, although if you are really into this stuff, you can make it work on a single family house level. But come up with like an economic dispatch model similarly to how grid resources are dispatched <laughs> based on the cost of developing those grid resources. Um, and then rank, rank how those get dispatched in the operation of the building. And this can, right, this approach should be technology agnostic. It's whatever wins, right? Whatever the lowest cost implementation is <clears throat> over the life cycle of that equipment. Um, and that approach could be scaled up, right, for a building, a campus, a neighborhood, a large urban system, or maybe even an entire city. So I'll get into more of that. 
right? So this electrify everything as soon as possible sort of trope is, is really, um, it's preventing people from taking action because that's what people think they need to do. So they just say, I can't do this. My engineer says it's impossible. I need, you know, the size of a tennis court to do the outdoor condensing units on my 500,000 square foot building. Like, that's crazy. Like, why, why are you even thinking that that's an option? Right, why, why go to the extreme? Don't design for the peak. Just don't design for the peak. Pick off the lowest cost measures that you can do today. Probably starts with LED lighting. <laughs> if you haven't done that, you should probably do it, right? And then go up from there and dig into that peak over time. I'll, I'll talk more about this, but you know, the goal is to drastically reduce or eliminate combustion. We're not getting there overnight. Increase efficiency at lower design temperatures. That's probably the one, like a pretty good first step. Um, try to remain resilient during extreme weather, so those extremely low temperatures. Um, utilize solutions that are demand conscious and energy grid interactive on the heating side, like on the gas side and on the electric side. And so there's, Mark, Mark and I actually worked in a rate case. Does everyone know what a rate case is? Like a utility rate case with the Public Service Commission? So we worked on that with National Grid in New York in the gas constrained area, which is Queens, the state of New York said you're not getting any more gas to the island of Long Island. No more. No more pipes. Come up with alternatives. We'll allow you to do gas demand response. So we were kind of influential in creating that gas demand response program. So understanding capacity from a gas perspective I think is really important too. Um, reduce thermal waste. You know, if you look at Manhattan and you see plumes of water vapor, you know, coming from the tops of a lot of these buildings, you've got a lot of large commercial office buildings that are cooling year round and they're just dumping their heat. I mean, when, when you point it out to the owner, hey, you know that you're dumping your heat and then you're heating to replace the heat that you're dumping using gas, they're shocked. I mean, they don't even realize that they're doing it. They're like, that's what that does? And it's, yeah. <laughs> and these are some of like the wealthiest, most influential property owners in the world. And they're just routinely doing it and regularly doing it. They don't realize like, actually they have a giant greenhouse building that's getting tons of sun and you are cooling the south side of the building while heating the north side of the building. Can you figure out how to capture that heat and just get it to the north side of the building? And oftentimes there's already hydronic distribution networks inside the building that would let you do it. You just have to reconfigure them. Um, so some of my work with the Empire Building Challenge, which is a program with NYSERDA, uh, is talking to these building owners, basically giving them this presentation and trying to get them to understand the nuances of taking these approaches. Uh, and we created this heuristic, which is like a fairly basic diagram to communicate you know, what this approach is. So if every building is a unicorn, right, and every owner scenario is like a unicorn, you can't just think that you're gonna come in and do the same thing in every building. It's almost impossible, right? But what you can replicate is the approach. And I think most people in this room intuitively know this stuff, but start by looking at the heating capacity. So when, where, how, and why are you using fossil fuel in the building? What does that look like exactly under all the different temperature and weather conditions? You know, really understand it. Like where is it physically in the building? How is gas being distributed? How is heat being distributed? Really understand the systems. That's step one, that's it. You know, New York City has an auditing law and we force building owners of buildings over a certain size to audit their buildings so that, you know, we hope they really understand their, their building. And they don't, I mean, a lot of these audits suck. <laughs> so we could do a lot more to improve that, but just start by reviewing the building and then look at reducing the lowest hanging fruit. So like, where can you reduce consumption, you know, for the lowest cost in the easiest ways? And so one way might just be putting a water source heat pump on the existing cooling tower condenser loop to pull heat off of it when you're doing simultaneous heating and cooling just to get the heat back into the building. Like very simple, right? Um, you know, draw a box around the building and think about all the thermal flows you know, going into and out of the building. And gas is one of them, it's just, right? It's chemical thermal storage. Um, so are you ventilating heat? Are you dumping it into your wastewater? 
is there a way is there a way to just capture the heat and get it back in the building? Like that is one of the big priorities. It's reduce and recover, um, and then you can go about the business of replacing capacity because you've made that easier by doing these other things, right? And can you maintain auxiliary heat for a 30-year period of time? Probably, yeah. Um, and then the last step, quite a while from now, is to cut the cord if and when something happens that enables you to do that. Um, I'm not really going to talk about this too much, but I guess the moral of the story here is just baseline the building, understand what's in it, understand what the opportunities are from the perspective of that heuristic, uh, and then do your asset baselining, like what's going to happen to the building or what do you think is going to happen to the building from an asset management perspective. Do you have equipment coming up for replacement? Do you have an old facade? Do you need to reposition? Are you prioritizing the Carrara Marble library, uh, lobby over, you know, replacing your boiler? Like, actually have those hard conversations, right? What's actually going to drive the value of the building? Is it the lobby that's probably going to go out of style in five years? Really think about that. Um, and believe it or not, like when we have this conversation with building owners, they're like, oh yeah, like I never thought about that. <laughs> I just thought I should spend $100 million on the lobby. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God. So it really is priorities and knowledge. Um, and so this is sort of like a general asset management pathway, uh, realizing that there's a major phase to understand like the conditions, the existing conditions in the building, working between your asset managers and, and engineers. They need to be speaking similar language, so you gotta get them in the room and to figure out where there are language problems between the two so that they can understand what each other is saying. Um, don't take for granted that they know what you're talking about. Like they, you need to teach them. <laughs> Um, asset managers aren't just going to automatically know what an engineer is saying. And oftentimes they're rolling their eyes and, or not paying attention. So they have to realize that all the stuff that you guys are talking about is asset management. It's the same thing. And if you're ignoring engi you know, engineering or technical challenges or decarbonization or anything like that, transitioning the building over time, then you're probably a bad asset manager and their boss should know that. <laughs> So one of the ways to get people on the same page is to hold a charrette. People may be familiar with design charrettes where everybody gets around a table and they throw ideas on the table and poke holes in other people's ideas. I think that's really important. It's borrowed from architecture. I know we hate architects, but we could learn that from them at least. <laughs> that it does work. You get people on the same page, right? It's important to get people on the same page and so that they will accept your idea because if everyone doesn't accept your idea, it's going nowhere. So one of the ways to get them to accept your idea is to make them think that they came up with it. And a charrette is a really good way to do that. Go ahead. So, so um, I'm concerned about the use of your term decarbonization. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like you're just moving the carbon generation from the building out to the power plant. 81% mm -hmm. of our electricity generation in the United States is from fossil fuels. So we're going to be burning stuff. Where are we going to be burning it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's shifting. Yes, we're getting more wind and more solar. Right. But right now, we're burning a ton of fossil fuels. Plus, you're, you're focused on buildings over 25,000 square feet, but most of America is in New York. 85% of what we build is less than 25,000 square feet. Right. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're easier. I, I'm, I'm hoping you're saying... They're easier. I, I'm hoping you're saying... <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm hearing you say efficiency first, right? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. A thousand percent. Yeah. Efficiency that's, first. That's totally critical. The word decarbonization, it's funny. Like, we pick, you know, pick your poison. Do you want to say electrification or decarbonization? you know, figure it out. Or come up with something else. Is it modernization? Yeah, but then some people might be triggered by the word modernization from the 1960s when we destroyed cities and displaced people. So, you know, pick your poison. Everyone's gonna hate some word. So I will change what word I use depending on who I'm talking to. If it gets them on the right page with you, fine. It's fine. It's okay. You don't have to be 
pure and consistent with the terminology that you're using. You just need to get people on the same page. Okay. So terminology aside, if we're actually setting like billions of dollars worth of investment on emission reduction targets, are the actual metrics behind what how that carbon accounting is being conducted thorough and legitimate? Because there's so much shell game out there. And you mentioned some of these, you know, getting to zero involves offsets, which are future trees that might be planted and maybe or maybe not will be cut down so that the yeah, decarbonation no, goals reached in 70 right. years. How are you organizing the definitions around the accounting such that there's actually legitimacy behind those investments? So EPA can accurately count emissions. It just takes them too long to do it. And so really what we need is to understand what the fleet deployment looks like in 15 minute intervals. But the ISOs won't release that information because they say that it's like secret, you know, security information. So what we really need is some policy that compels the ISO to release a scrubbed version of that information. Real-time carbon coefficients. That's real, based on the actual fleet deployment. And you know, everybody is only just getting their arms around the nuances with offsets today. And I think forest fires help show like you know, tree-based offsets aren't great because um, they're not permanent. So there is a better sophistication in ESG world around offsets. And I think what this is going to be is like somebody does something, everyone praises them because everyone thinks it's great. And then we like revise what we think is great and then we criticize that same person. So we're going to keep doing that <laughs> forever, which I think is what society kind of does. I mean, in reality, you can't look in the past and judge people based on today's culture, but we're probably going to do that. It's going to be a mess. It is. Just one quick question. Why won't the ISOs uh, release uh, Time of use uh, carbon. Yeah, because we need to know when during the day are the power plants using that. coal. Right. So, so the reason the reason that the ISO and, and remember remember who runs the ISO, right? It's trans transmission owners who actually also own generation because that's the way we do it here, right? It's fully integrated. It's not really an independent system operator. But regardless of all that, the fact is that what they're saying is that if you knew what was dispatched at that point in time, you'd have a competitive advantage. And so what these, right, uh, yeah, a great, great reaction, right? So, so that's, that, the, no, no transparency because, right, then you might know what I dispatched during that period and then you can come along and predate and, and so they don't, so they're saying it's a trade secret. That's, that's where the ISO comes down on this is that, that knowing the dispatch order and knowing what's coming off the plant during that period is actually a, 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 a trade secret and, and proprietary. So I, I think we don't care like what specific power plant is doing what. Like so scrub it, just scrub it and release the time of use carbon code. Right, right. That's because. It. Because you can't de define a, uh, a time of day activity in a building right. to decarbonize if you don't know you're drawing on a, on a coal plant. That's right. correct. That's exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's the, yeah, the marginal emissions. Yep. Um, so this, this diagram is totally ridiculous. It's got like so much going on. <laughs> it really is. It is. Um, but basically it, like it, what, it, it what came is from this? A it came from a charrette? Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Just get everything on the board. Get everything. Um, so it, all it is is showing just a bunch of different building typologies uh, and where the opportunities are to you know, reduce, reconfigure the uh, energy transmission within the building, right? The, the networks that are in the building. You could call an existing hydronic distribution system inside of a building a thermal network. Like you could call it that. Um, how to recover and store heat. Uh, and then, you know, what should you start to replace um, over time? Again, over time, I think that's the key. That's the key word here. And then someone asked about thermal energy networks. Well, like what happens when this hydronic distribution goes outside the building? And or what if it already exists in the city, like Jamestown, New York, which is a high temperature hydronic network since the 1980s. Uh, and nearly all of its buildings in the central business district, which are not like very large buildings, are connected to it. 
So, you know, what happens when we start to capture the heat flows that we're wasting on an urban scale and try to get it back into buildings? If you think about how many BTUs are leaving through an outfall tube of a wastewater treatment plant and just going into the ocean, it's just staggering. It's an unbelievable amount of heat. So why don't we capture it? And or I think about, I grew up next to Indian Point nuclear power plant and they just dumped that heat into the Hudson River. You know, that's, that's not okay. <laughs> uh, actually, Con Ed Steam, here's a good one. Con Ed Steam is one way. And building owners are required to quench the steam condensate before they, with potable cold water, before they dump it back into the sewer. So they're also paying for expensive potable water to quench their steam condensate. Instead of just trying to recover the heat off of it, they just dump it into the sewer. It's incredible. Um, how often have you stood in the New York City subway and sweat your ass off? <laughs> it's really hot, even in the winter. Even in the winter sometimes. There's all of this um, uh, infiltration groundwater that comes into the subway and picks up all of that heat before it's pumped with massive pumps back into the Hudson or East River. There's a lot of heat in that water, so why aren't we figuring out how to capture it? Um, so outside the building, right? And so I'm gonna use like, f you know, froofy terms here, but this could also be like business. You could take a pretty uh, capitalistic view of this opportunity, but build a community-based coalition and potentially an infrastructure development fund where you partner with existing stakeholders in a community and work with municipal partners to authorize some entity to access the public right of way and to access the heat that's being wasted and redirect that back to buildings through a thermal network. Um, so the Geothermal Technology Office uh, from DOE is starting to embrace this concept. They released a program recently and they're talking about community coalition building, right? That sounds really nice, but it could also be a private entity that comes in and does some deal with a mayor <laughs> and gets authorization to do this work and then goes and raise, raises money on the capital markets to build thermal networks. So what are thermal networks? Right, we realize that you know fossil fuel heating is going to be replaced with heat pumps over 30 years. Right, there's sort of no way around it. Maybe it's a mix of heat pumps plus some other things. I know that everybody, people are talking about hydrogen. <laughs> people are talking about a lot of things. People are talking about ammonia, um, which is a hydrogen carrier. Uh, you know, whether you love them or not, they do have trouble during design day. So I could I could edit the 35 degrees and make that zero but they still have trouble during the design day. Like, and when they all turn on at the same time, there's some trouble. Um, the average temperature is increasing, but the extreme highs and lows, uh, and those events are also increasing because we're losing the natural processes that have regulated temperature in North America. So we're seeing extremes in very low latitudes um, and extreme highs in very high latitudes, unfortunately. Uh, I like water source heat pumps because we could drive COPs pretty, pretty high. But what's the combination of multiple technologies including air source heat pumps to drive like holistic performance high? So ther thermal energy networks utilize a, a heat transfer fluid. It's usually water to move heat right around a district between buildings. It could be a campus. It could be just two, two houses, right? Um, it allows for efficient trading of heat. Right? It creates heat suppliers and it creates a market for what would be something really expensive for an individual building owner. It allows you to share cross to cross multiple building owners. Um, that's why we have shared infrastructure because we could share costs across multiple parties. Right? Um, and network heating and cooling sources, right? They're, they traditionally include energy from combustion, so like the Jamestown district thermal system, vicinity. Um, but waste heat, geothermal, different storage facilities, you know, technology is flexible and networks are agnostic. So if you use an ambient temperature loop, right, a, a loop that's at the temperature of the ground, you know, 65 degrees, um, you could plug a lot of different things into that thing. Uh, it doesn't really care what you plug into it. So that's, I think, really important. 
Um, this is something from our friends in Scandinavia. So if you want to visualize what a thermal energy network looks like, there it is. Um, don't try to read it. <laughs> but like, what is storage, right? Thermal storage is so many different things. We're hearing things about compressed air storage for electric storage, but what comes off of the compression cycle? Lots of heat. Can you put that into a network? What happens when that big LNG tanker dumps all of its gas in Boston? It gets pretty cold. So can we take that? So there's, there's a lot of really interesting ways, I think, to move heat, capture heat, um, if we start to think in the realm of like industrial ecology. And I think that's everybody's job, right? So there's networks inside of buildings that we should be thinking about from an industrial ecology perspective. And then don't be afraid to think outside the building. So this is directly from that GTO office at DOE. They're saying that we need to have all the stakeholders involved if you're going to enter the public right of way. That's totally true. You know, what's the framework to get that done? I think about history. Um, and I think about how the gas network evolved to begin with. Right, and so you may have heard the term town gas. Right, where private enterprise was taking coal and they were gasifying it and creating hydrogen and methane plus some other things and piping that to people's homes and to street lamps, mostly for lighting. Um, so that's town gas. And how did we get to where we are today with big investor-owned utilities? Lots of merger and acquisition activity and regulation. So private enterprise, in my opinion, has a pretty strong role in developing these connections between buildings. Uh, and municipals, you know, this is required, municipals have to be involved in that. So a lot of people just say, like, this is too difficult, like, we can't do this. But we've done it throughout history, and authorities are how we build new infrastructure, just in general as a society in the Western Hemisphere. We work with private enterprise to build infrastructure, and then the returns on it diminish over time, and they become socialized. <laughs> That's what we do, right? I think it's important too to realize that that to expect what we come today to know to know as the the monopoly investor-owned utility. This this is way outside their DNA, right? This is way outside their DNA to go and be entrepreneurial and lay a completely different network. What, what, what utilities who are in their position that they're in now over the last 80 years have done is consolidate and then go to the regulator and get a rate increase, okay, and, 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 and gold plate their system. But that's not what, what's, what's required here. This, this, this really does require some significant entrepreneurial type of DNA, and so that's where we're, we're, we're thinking that it's going to make more sense to, to, to go in this direction. So go ahead, Jared. So here's just a list of different stakeholders. What's really interesting is <clears throat> New York State just passed the Thermal Energy Network law. I don't know if anyone's been paying attention to that. But they basically passed legislation to amend the public service law to authorize existing regulated utilities to own networks that aren't just steam, electric, and gas. And really all they did was delete the reference to gas, steam, and electric. So are you two folks aware of what's going on around in the Boston yes. area? Yes. So the Heat Organization, a private little nonprofit, has partnered with Eversource and National yep. Grid to do geo-grid networks. And then you know that's what's happened at Ball State, you know what's happened yep. at Stanford, you know what's happened at Colorado Mesa, because in a way it feels to me like you're giving people the impression that this is something we should dream of. People are doing it. People are doing it, People yeah. are doing and it. And they've done it. It's been done. It's been done. So what's the thing stopping it from happening more extensively? Awareness. It's awareness and regulation. So often, you know, activists would say, well, why, why can't Con Edison build these thermal energy networks like what he is doing with Eversource? Because they weren't allowed. Con Ed doesn't care what it does, really. It really doesn't. It's sort of a robot, and the software that it runs on is the public service law. 
So, you know, we got to look at the public service law, figure out how to change it, maybe not too radically, but change it just enough that enables them to take action. And I'm not saying that they're not going to play a huge role in doing this, but they haven't built anything brand new in a very long time, if ever. Right, so, in their current incarnation, they, they don't they don't do that. Go ahead. So and, so and so just, and just, just just to be clear, to answer that, right? I mean, what had to be done to get EverSource the National Grid to the table was some pretty significant arm twisting for a long. Okay, I mean, this is not, I mean, this is this is, the, and they also had to be worse. Not just coerced, but they also had to have it be completely riskless, right? Yeah. So the rate payer, the rate payer is paying for it, right? There's no risk for them at all in this. The, this this is coming out of your rates if you're not on the loop, right? So 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 that's the, so that's why when we say it's not in their DNA, that's what we're talking about. I I, I worked for a gas company for many years, love the utility, think it's a great idea Guaranteed. for doing this. So it might not be the, it might not be the best answer, particularly when the the business model is put as many BTUs as I can through the meter to make money, right? I mean, that's that's the real issue, is, is yeah. the business model for them is get as many BTUs through the meter as I possibly can. And, oh, by the way, the electricity, the electricity company also has the same type of business model, which is get as many kilowatt hours through that meter as I possibly can, particularly in the winter. Demand. Particularly in the winter because it's off peak, right? And my system's not built out yet to where I can't serve that, right? So that's just land yap, right? They want to deliver that 300% increase. They really do. They get a guaranteed <laughs> return on it. They really do. That's okay, okay. 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 So, so you know what we're saying here, right? So, so I'd like us all to think about uh, supply chain uh, yeah. it, th th that's going to make this successful. Apart from when we twist all the arms, we've got all the policy, and now we can have distributed generation, we could have entrepreneurial uh, uh, generation, local generation, local storage, and all that. And if we think about the limiting resource at that point, we're going to hear a little bit about this afternoon from Kimberly Llewellyn, yeah. which is that nobody knows how to do it. Right. And nobody will be able to run little tiny micro utilities all over the country because they don't know how to do it. Right. And that will be a limiting factor right now. Right. Because as soon as we try to do it, we're going to realize it's not easy to run a utility now. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. That that's going to be a, a big problem. Right. And if you have if anybody has any doubt about that, consider the fact that we blew up part of Lawrence, Massachusetts, because when yeah. we're putting the the uh, the gas line in there, something I'm sure you remember, yeah. this sensor was in the wrong place for the pressure sensor. Right, so right. it thought we were at low pressure, so therefore they blew up the line. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about things that go boom. Okay. Right, and kill people. Okay, and, and things that <laughs> ignite. Right. So, so uh, the fact that in this building here, when we were going to change the MERV 13 filters, we did get permission from the from the facility manager for the larger corporation to do it. He personally was on the roof because he had to fire three facility managers here in six weeks because they didn't show up on the job. One had a drug problem, the other yeah. guy just quit, and, and the third guy just never right. showed up at all. With and when he did, he was sick. You know. This is what we're talking about with these lovely little micro utilities. It right, is a right. limiting factor, and we got to think about that right now. Right. <clears throat> I mean, not to mention like manufacturing supply chain, That's knowledge, the knowledge problem. supply chain, all, all of that. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge. It is a huge problem. Which so the boom is the sort of the thing that kind of gave uh, some wind and heat sales. You know which is, you know, similarly being discussed in other cities like Philadelphia. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, Sorry, um, I used to design mi million square foot HVAC mm. systems as well. And I just have to think that maybe there's not a huge uh, pathway for translation between large installations in very urban situations and the kind of um, buildings that most of the people in this room design. And I have thought for a long time the best stuff comes from the survivalist network, farm and ranch, and backcountry camping. Right. And I just think that um, 
the solution for people in this room may not be distributed, but it may be very isolated within the confines of your single family home. And I think what we need to figure out is not just the storage, but the distribution because upstate New York, there's a lot of radiant systems. Yep. Minneapolis, Minnesota, a lot of radiant systems, right? But everywhere else in the country, we do not have hydronic distribution systems. Right. We don't have terminal units. So I think we need to look to Northern Europe to see how to cover the distribution and the limited storage and do some, some very specific capacity calculations to confirm what percentage of houses, at what size, with what occupancy, in right. what climate zone, can really tolerate being moved to a hydronic system, which maybe then we add solar thermal, right? right. But So I understand exactly what you're talking about of, of thermal storage, but the translation, I think, is, is really a hard sell in this room. Right. So, I mean, if we think about, like, urban agglomerations where you've got low, like, distance between buildings, it does start to make sense. Right, it's the it's the uh, calculation that you do to determine whether or not you wanted a municipal water system. It's very similar or sewer. Right. Fortunately, in a lot of the Northeast, right, most people are living in those kinds of places. But except for extreme conditions, site based within a single family is a doable thing with hydronic systems. Right. Right. Um, you mentioned Nordic countries, right? They're very hydronic. Yeah. Yeah, extremely. Um, and then out in the street. And by the way, it doesn't have to be right. radiators under the window. We have overhead yep. ceiling-based linear fin radiant systems that are high efficiency, and they look great and they're perfect for retrofit because you right. can tack them onto your existing. Yeah, just to get to lower temperature. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And then and then water like if we're doing you know, air distribution in buildings, furnace, right? Water to air, I mean, that's a fairly established technology. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a quick question. The, uh, what if you had a model to retrofit existing commercial buildings that eliminated gas but did not increase the electric use and actually shaved demand? It, depend it depends what existed prior. <laughs> Right? So the question was, what um, examples of buildings, or are there examples of buildings that didn't increase demand if they've eliminated gas? Right? So it depends what they were using gas for. Did they, were they using a gas chiller? Gas heat, a lot of the time it's either rooftop units or boilers. And then how are they cooling? Heat pumps. Okay, so they already had heat pumps to cool and then they're using no, gas. No, you're heat. replacing the existing systems, either rooftops so it really using depends, gas. It really depends on what's in the building to begin with, right? So if you've got electric cooling, right, maybe it's like 15 years old or something, like you put in uh, an electric chiller and then you still have a steam boiler um, for heating, you, you can probably only increase your peak by a little bit. You know, We've actually building. got a model that's doing a lot better than that. Yeah, no, I, I bet, I bet. But if you've got a gas-fired absorber chiller, right, or you're making steam in a boiler and running a steam absorber chiller, you're going you're to increase your peak, right? No. So there are certain things that, like, we just can't get over. <laughs> if a if a building is all gas right now, it's gonna it's gonna create a new peak. Like that's it, you know, and we have to figure out how to do that in the right way. <laughs> so just back to this like idea of building a framework or an approach to getting communities or municipalities to think about shared infrastructure. You know, I often think of like a master developer that is brought in to reposition a downtown. You know, I think in the Boston region, a lot of that has happened over the past 20 years. A lot of that has happened in the New York region and as elsewhere in large metropolitan areas where a municipality will partner with a master developer. They will assist in acquisition. The developer will do private acquisition of existing buildings and then wholly reposition that downtown with pretty major redevelopment. Um, that is a model, I think, that we could learn from for decarb in urban areas, in existing urban areas, and for the development of thermal energy networks. So this question came in from Gary Klein on Zoom. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> uh, what about water 
heating. In buildings with better thermal envelopes, which we're all striving to create, water heating is often larger than space heating. Sure. Um, so in a lot of the buildings that I deal with, certainly when you are cooling, you're creating a lot of heat, and you should be capturing that to at least offset your water heating use or your gas use for water heating right during the cooling period. In a lot of the buildings that I work with, they're, again, they're cooling year round. So use that heat for domestic hot water. Um, if you hybridize domestic hot water plants with existing gas, right? So say you have a gas fired domestic hot water plant and it's okay, right? Like it's good, it's operating. Maybe you went to condensing five years ago and that's cool. Um, leave it, right? And add the air source air to water heat pump. Right, like the CO2 high temperature air to water heat pump and run it only when you should run it. Right, so you're not blowing up your budget. Um, so I think like that hybridization I think is really important for domestic hot water. And again, trying to recapture heat from those, those heat flows within the building to make domestic hot water, that's probably one of the first things that you should think about doing versus trying to tackle space heat. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the buildings that I've managed in New York, and actually most of them are six-story buildings, I will say. <laughs> They're like relatively simple six-story buildings um, with big steam boilers and steam radiators, and how do, you, how do you transition a building like that that's full of low and moderate income people and there's no vacancy? Um, overclads, right, because you're leveraging the saved costs on um, maintenance of the brick facade. In New York, you have to maintain your brick facade and you get hit with extremely high cost to assess the brick facade every few years and then repair it. You must repair whatever they find. Um, that's extremely expensive. Just the, the sidewalk bridging is extremely expensive, so that will help justify doing the overclad. It's not really the energy savings that, that justifies the overclad. It's the facade maintenance savings, really. Um, and then after that, how do you make your steam system as efficient as possible? And then after that, maybe you want to think about some on-site solar. And then after that, how do you start to deal with domestic hot water? And can we hybridize? What can we do about that? Um, and if people do those things that I just said, they will be under these emissions caps and they won't be fine for quite a while. Like they'll sail right through 2030. And this is like a typical, you know, brick, I don't know, 125 unit, um, multifamily building in Brooklyn or Queens, for example. Yeah. So I work for the Navy, and one of the things that we're required to do is redundancy for power sourcing. And yep. so, um, but we're not the only organization that requires redundancy, hospitals, things like that. So can you speak to redundancy and the elimination of natural gas? Because I don't know of any other way to do redundancy in the future. Neither do I. Okay, good. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer I mean, to that. Because what you're talking about to me feels, you know, it's, it, it feels good to think about all this stuff and to try sure. to achieve all this, but it's scary to me. But how often are you doing that? How often do you need your emergency backup? Okay, so think about oh, oh, that. Not often, right? maybe, but it's just a requirement sure. that there must be an, so, another source. So maybe we don't care. Maybe it's the very last thing that we think about. It's probably not the thing that should keep us up at night right now. I'm serious. Well, unless so, you're in the hospital. Unless you're in the hospital, yeah. Then you, then need, you, you, need, you need the gas. You yeah. need to run this generator. Right. It's a critical service. Yeah. It's probably not the decarbonization thing that you want to think about right now. Think about it last. That's all, that all, that's all I'm going to say about it. Like, don't try to do lithium ion batteries to pick up your emergency loads. That's insane. <laughs> Keep your generator for a long time. You know, and if you can, like, okay, here's something. Is it, if it's a diesel generator and it's got a resistance block heater, put a heat pump on that. They make it. They make an air source heat pump for block heaters for just to keep the engine block warm so that it's ready to start up. Like do that. Yeah, just to warm it up. That that's what you could do. I wouldn't I would not think about replacing it right now. It's like at the bottom of the barrel. It's the bottom of the list. Um, so I, my name is Jonathan Tabin, and I'm a professor at the University of Arizona, and my solar decathlon teams have been working on elements of this. There's no way that I could hear what you're saying. I literally have no idea what you're saying. I'm sorry about that. Is this better? I think so, okay. yeah. My name is Jonathan Bean, and I'm a professor at the University of Arizona, and my solar decathlon teams have been working on this 
problem for the last few years, last four years, in the context of a hot climate where the dominant demand is air conditioning and cooling for buildings. So one of the things I just wanted to underline from a previous perspective, and I think that is embedded in your talk, but maybe not coming through because of your experience in, in New York, is that these kinds of things need to be place-based, regional, yeah. right? They need to be responsive to the particular characteristics. And one of the things that's really opened my eyes in, in the context of working on this is that our, all of our codes are bottom up, right, in a, in a way, because we have to get cities, most of us have to get cities to adopt the code. Most of us have to get utility guidelines yeah. change at the regional level. And a lot of, of what, what we're doing as a community or as a group is trying to change the structural conditions from the top down. Yep. So I, I just wanted to really underscore that and say that you're, and maybe I, what I, the question that I have for you is how does what you're presenting change if you're not focused on providing heating, if you're provo focused on providing cool? I think it's very similar. I think it's actually really similar. Um, I do agree, right, every, like, every, I didn't not say that it's not place-based. I said every building is a unicorn and every ownership scenario is a unicorn. Like every building is completely different. I, I'm not one of these people that just says like we could just replicate solutions across every building. I, I think that that's wrong. I think that some agencies like NYSERDA, um, which I'm employed by so I have to be careful what I say, uh, and policymakers want to shoehorn things and it just doesn't work like that. So what we can do is adopt just an approach that thinks about this in a very rational way and try to communicate that rational approach to all those big stakeholders that are changing policy, right? If there's a working group in your state that's dealing with policy or in your city, like get on it and like be loud, be that annoying person that vocalizes this stuff. We, um, we're, we're very good at that from this room. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I'm sure there's a lot of people doing that, right? Um, but we need to be louder about it. And we also need to not fight with activists. <laughs> we have to get them on the side and talk through the nuances of this stuff so that they can adopt this language that you could speak in unison. So I'll give just one example of this, and it's not, it's not an example of an activist. Um, it's an example of a labor union. So one of the reasons why we switched from electrification to decarbonization is because the plumbers and pipe fitters hated the word electrification. <laughs> because they thought it was going to put them out of business. And, I, and I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. Like, why do they think that? Words matter. Yeah, words matter. I'm like, why do they think that? Because like everything's moving to air side, like duct work and air source heat pumps, and just there's no room for moving heat with pipe. Yeah, that's what they thought. That's exactly what they thought. So we got them in a room. We went through a different version of this presentation, showed them this diagram and just explained, listen, it probably means a lot more pipe, especially in urban areas. Like a lot more pipe, like maybe three times as much pipe. And you, you could just see it like settling in. And they're like, well, why do they call it electrification? And I'm just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Like, what, what do you want to call it? <laughs> well, why don't we call it decarbonization? And I was just blown. My mind was blown because these, these were definitely people that don't like to talk about climate change. And they're embracing the word decarbonization because it's less bad than electrification. <laughs> it was just like, what? OK, cool. Like, literally, what do we do? What do we do? Call the governor right now. <laughs> right now. And tell her to listen to this crew <laughs> around this table. And we got it into the budget bill. Like, because of them. Worked for 10 years to get them to start thinking about this. And it was just like, we can't do that. This is so crazy. Why are you going to do anything like that? The Thermal Energy Network bill. They got it into the budget. And... At the same time, the labor union went to a very pro-construction trades um, New York senator in Brooklyn, and like very pro-real estate. So like not the uh, darling of the progressive movement. <laughs> um, 
So they went to him and they said, can you like reach across your democratic aisle to the crazies and get them on board? Literally. And he's like, okay, let me see if I could do that. And they did. And the really interesting timing on it was that the activists were pushing this other bill that was going to eliminate the gas company's obligation to serve. They call it the 100-foot rule, meaning if you apply for gas service, they have to serve you. So the legislation was going to eliminate that, and the utility could say, no, we're not going to serve you. Um, and then there were also some gas phase, there was gas phase out language in that bill. And it went down in a ball of flames. And so as it went down in the ball of flames, the activists were just desperate. What can we do? And they all piled onto this thermal energy network bill. And it, went, it just sailed through. I don't think anybody voted against it. It was pretty wild. Um, so I think language really does matter. Getting people on the same page, getting them to understand like what are, what's the real thing that we're trying to do here? Like stop peacocking and you know trying to like flaunt your progressive bona fides, or stop just being married to natural gas for whatever emotional reason you love gas, right? Um, let's get together and talk about what the real issues are, and and come up with solutions. So it's not about everybody in the boat rowing; it's about everybody rowing in the same direction. In the same direction, they could be in completely different boats. Someone's in a, a natural gas fired motorboat. Someone else is in like a you know the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria. <laughs> and, but if they're all going in the same direction and they're generally saying the same thing, or the politicians hear the same thing, you're, you're going to make change. You're going to make good change. Another question here. Yeah, Bruce yeah. Harley. Uh, I, I want to just mention something that relates to a couple things you said very early in the talk. I, a lot of my work is in small residential sized air source heat pumps, air to air and air to water, developing rating procedures that actually let us find out how they really work and which was an important point that you made. You know, we, we need to understand better how they really work. We need to understand than, how they work. Rather than yeah. using like the the uh, the DOE test procedure that that's like the Volkswagen diesel. I heard you test. talking before. But, I mean, can you just tell everybody what you said earlier? I was literally listening to uh, that, about that analogy and it yeah, was, the, the, I was the, laughing my the, ass Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the rating procedure we use to determine or to publish the efficiency of air source heat pumps and air conditioners is a lot like the, the diesel emission test that Volkswagen got in so much trouble for, except instead of being done on the sly and lying about it, it's required by federal regulation mm -hmm. that everybody do it that way. And so we're working on alternatives where we're doing load-based testing. Usually it's not the capacity of the equipment at cold conditions that is hard to determine. The manufacturers are actually pretty good at stating what they can produce in terms of heat. Um, but uh, yeah, so a lot of my work is in small heat pumps, and I do want to push back just because I'm concerned about what people's takeaway is, mm -hmm. that, that all heat pumps have electric resistance backup. No, they don't. And, I, and I've worked mm -hmm. with a lot of builders and design projects where there's, they, they, there is no electric resistance in the system at all. Right. And I think, you know, we can design heat pump systems in really modestly retrofitted homes in really cold climates that produce 100% of the demand, you know, uh, design heat so, load. So it could be modular and meet yeah. different portions of the load, yeah. right? And, so and, that's and, really and, important. And, yeah. and everything else that you've said, except the bigger thermal network stuff, can yeah. still apply to individual homes in less dense uh, but what, what is? But then I guess the question that I ask, well then what is the cost decision of doing that last 10% to peak Okay, yeah, and well, what are the options? And, and, and I think, yeah. you know, some of them are 100% size to the heating design load, which is usually, uh, you know, something like 40% bigger than what the actual heating mm -hmm. actual heating peak load is. Mm -hmm. So there's a big margin there. And then, you know, sometimes maybe we put in a kilowatt or two of, the you know, you don't size it as emergency heat, you size it as a very small supplement. And then when you make the better envelope improvements, that goes away entirely. So, so what I'm suggesting is like if you had to put in that resistance element just to carry yourself because it, ultimately the owner needed to make the whatever cheaper decision, right? Um, what, can, what else can you do to eat away at that level of resistance? And is there some other thermal storage element that you could implement that could help do that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Joe, we're, Joe, we're getting to, it's, it's 8 yeah. to 10 right now. Yes. 
Okay. Eight more minutes. <laughs> Eight minutes to ten. Just wanted to let you know that there are there there may be people who want coffee or something. That they, a break. No, we're gonna carry on. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. No, I'm all, I'm all for it. I just want to be you know recognize, you know, recognize people's time. <laughs> You're the first speaker that's actually talked to me about time. What the heck? You know, this is about time. It is about time. That's it. 2050 is coming. So let's uh, let's carry on for another 15 minutes if you have questions, because I'm intrigued. And um, there's a bunch of people. Uh, you. Just really quick, just back on that point. Just really quick. Okay, back on that point. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the company SunAmp. Is anyone familiar with that company? They're from, um, yeah, they're from Scotland. They are really cool. You talk to them on Zoom and they have Scottish accents. But they have this really awesome um, heat exchanger that's integrated with a face change material, like thermal battery. And it, it also can have a resistance element in it that is timed to say on-site generation like solar. Um, so, you know, you can mitigate your air source heat pump operation through that. That's an interesting way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sun amp. Yeah. So one of your first slides, you sort of lay the framework out of this is this is all in pursuit of decarbonization goals, speaking of time, in the next 10, 20 years, so on and so forth. Yeah. And so transition period between now and then to decarbonize. Just recently you said, talking to the pipe fitters union and whatnot, we've got three times the amount of pipe that's going to need to be deployed here. Mm -hmm. So from civil, you know, pipe infrastructure development all the way down through, you know, terminal units inside buildings, yeah. it's an enormous amount of enormous. stuff yeah. that needs to be manufactured and deployed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm super used to seeing all of that externalized and it's always someone else's emission yeah. and you know fine we can you know there's we, we can kind of shuffle those around depending on who's responsible for what scope what I'm seeing here is an, like there is no like scope three that's away in the extent of the boundaries that you're drawing around this transition plan right but I haven't heard anything about the immediate plume of emissions that I'm worried is going to literally blow Fry all of these goals out of the yeah. water before we even get to to realize any of these benefits. Right. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. We absolutely have to do everything you're talking about. I get really worried that it's like physically impossible to do that without an emission plume that will make all of this irrelevant within the time frame we have to it, work. It might, it might be. Did you see Don't Look Up? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's one of, I mean, unfortunately, right? Like, I, I don't have an answer to that. But I do think that it needs to be forced into the conversation. And the only thing that forces it into the conversation is if you put a price on it and if you regulate it. That's it. So if you think embedded carbon is extremely important, then go rally up a whole coalition of activists to go threaten to burn the state house to the ground unless embedded carbon is in the mix here. Right, right now, conscious. yeah, right now, I mean, the Pitchfork. politicians are sounding just like me. It's just too tough. We can't deal with it right now. I mean, we can, we're smart, we could deal with it. We could deal with it. Um, they just need to deal with it. <laughs> they need to know that the constituents think it's important. And, you know, but, so like, why don't we have a conversation around what's better? Is it copper wire and switch gear and all this shit? Or is it plastic pipe with high recycled plastic content? Right? It might be, it might be the pipe. Yeah. If you look at the total, total life cycle emissions. So I, I know that intuitively, but I haven't seen a real study on it um, because everyone's sort of just trying to deal with the easiest things first. Yeah. Well, and they're which just sucks. They're, 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 to your point, <laughs> somebody just, do it. They're, somebody they're do that. They're just now getting to the point where they can understand what a 50 megawatt PV solar footprint is, okay? I mean, and, and, and the payback on that is about four years, right? So you get the carbon, carbon you, get, you get the carbon payback is about four years on that. Now, that's the simplest thing out there, right? So this is, so, so but, but once again, it's, it's algebra, right? It's not, it, 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 it's not calculus, it's, it's, no. it's algebra. You just have to have the will to sit down and, and, and do the algebra, right? And hopefully the, it's not the accountants and the lawyers that get rich, but the, you know, the, the, because the, they will course but 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 the point is that on, on this you have to have the will to to do that and recognize that it's there but 
you also have to be realize you have to also have to realize that that can also be somewhat of a red, of a red herring for people as well. They say, oh, well, well, it's gonna we're gonna what you know you're gonna run up all the steel. You know, no, that's not really what's gonna happen. And you're gonna have these assets that are gonna go for 50 years. But you're right. I mean, and, and I, I I teach classes on solar, and, and people say, well, you know, what about all this polysilicon? What about all the you know yeah. all this aluminum that's that's being made? Well, we kind of know it's about a four year payback on the carbon, and then you put it in, and boom, and, and you're done. So there's a truth. You can do this. You can do this work. Yep. There is a truth out there. Right, like I keep, I just in general, we we should just in general as humans, we should be pushing people toward gray area instead of extremes, instead of having like a hidden agendas and and whatever, right? So I, you know, I bet you in ten years that's going to be the wedge issue. You already see some people talking about ESG and how we should get rid of it because it's a lie, right? So it's like I thought you didn't care about climate change. <laughs> what? So. What? <laughs> so it's going to be, that will be a wedge. So we shouldn't do anything because it's going to create emissions up front. Yeah. Okay, so then what should we do? Exactly. Right? That's the question. It's gray. It's, gray. Right. it's a gray discussion. It's a nuanced discussion. We can have new nuanced discussions. We're all like adults. Right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I have a couple of points. First of all, what the activists have to learn is how buildings work. Okay, so the example that I gave of the heat team. What they didn't know when I first started working with them is that they didn't understand the service temperature of most buildings in Boston, mm -hmm. since they're steam-based, and that heat pumps can't make those temperatures. That very simple physical fact had escaped them, right? So they yeah. had to recalibrate. The second thing, cold climate heat pumps is the right term, not air source heat pump. Yeah. So I have, I'm Massachusetts based, used to live in New Hampshire. I have buildings north of the New Hampshire White Mountains without backup working on air source heat pumps, cold climate heat pumps. My own Fujitsu, I have measured at seven below, carefully measured COP at over two. Okay, so his slides are that's way good. out of date on how heat pumps can work. Yeah. And that's not even, right? So, so, so we, we don't have a technology problem. We have a lack of products that we'd like to see mm -hmm. with existing possible technologies because the demand signal has not been sent. That's the gap, not the technology. That's really important to understand. In northern Minnesota, people shouldn't live there Right? But, but, to, but to that point, right? Two, two more, just really quick, really quick. Two, two more things. Yeah. They really didn't get a chance to talk about something that is really key here, even though it was on their slides. Mm. And I've done a bunch of modeling on this on smaller scales than cities, because New York City hasn't asked me, thank God. <laughs> uh, thermal storage is going to be a really key part of it, not just transition, tr tr yeah. transfer between buildings, but thermal storage within buildings, in the ground. It's really important. And if you do a careful model of a building like this, the reduction that you can get in peak load is really big. And the reduction, if you're thinking about net zero and transfer of electricity back and forth from the building to the grid, gets greatly reduced if you can use excess PV in your building to store thermal heat. So it's going to be a combination of thermal and batteries. And then the last thing, because so many questions about our been, have been about why we can't, so many points have been about why we can't do stuff. And yes, we need a whole cadre of people that can do this, including engineers, because most of the engineers are screwing us by double sizing the new equipment. Yeah. So, Václav Havel said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out right. It's the conviction that you're doing the right thing. Right? So we're all doing the right thing. Stay positive. And that was to, a check. To, to your point, right? To your point on technology, right? We have the technology. It's not the technology. But don't get enamored with a particular technology. Because there's this whole suite. And then there's also a whole set of ways to integrate those different technologies together. Like in a total variety of ways that we, have, that we can't forget about, right? Just don't slap in that one-to-one -one replacement. Like, just don't do that. Resist. <laughs> Someone asks you to do it, say like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. I think there's other things that you could do. Um, so I think that's it's this nuanced discussion gray area. 
Last question. Okay, uh, two quick statements. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mark did it, so, you know, he's, my, he's one of my heroes, so I can't help it. Um, I don't think you covered it, but the, uh, the uh, low or zero carbon emissions uh, uh, for the whole country uh, were at over 40% electrical generation that yes. is zero carbon emissions. Pretty we're wild, at, right? We're not at 20%, we're over 40% and growing at one to two percent percentage points per year. It's happening very And that's fast. mostly solar, right? Solar, wind, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's first. Okay, second, the... The, gro the, the growth is mostly solar right, right, right. now. Yeah. Um, the slide that you had up just before about the, the process slide. Uh, I work, uh, I'm a no. practitioner and activist in electrification and decarbonization, and, but mostly residential. And this doesn't, this net present value calculation kind of stuff, that doesn't happen for small buildings for the most part. Unfortunately. Sing homeowners, small yeah. landlords. There needs to be a different process, there needs to be different signals, as Mark says, to help them along. Right. So, but then how are they qualified to have a mortgage? They can't think? Like, shouldn't we be offering them that? No, no, we shouldn't be offering them. It's, 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 not, it's not there right like, no, I know. We should offer it. And then if they don't know what net present value or net present cost is, we should teach them. And like, here's your multiple options, and here's the net present cost of the option as compared to others. You know, they're smart enough to have a mortgage. I know, like, that's a whole debate. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you in 2000? I know, I know, I know. But right, we well, can talk about, we should be talking about that with customers, I think. Yeah. All right, apparently we have a comment from Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm a physician and then went into architecture. So I just want to make a comment, not a question, that John Levy at BU did a study that showed that homes that were switched over to electrification had significantly lower pediatric asthma oh, rates. Yeah. So from the health side, yes. I just wanted to And the, the women at HEAT, I think, are doing some cool work around supporting that research. I thought you said the women in heat. The, wi the women in heat. <laughs> the women in heat are doing that. Yeah. The women no, are the, doing important the, work. <laughs> the organization heat, right, the home energy efficiency team, um, is, is focused on indoor air quality. That's a huge issue. And it is really, I think it's the thing that activates a lot of activists to deal with this issue more than the climate change issue because it's the indoor air quality problem that's more acute to the people that they serve. Yeah. All right. Um, I come for it. This has been Sorry. fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Warm thank you for our, our guests from our state. All right, please, everybody back at 10.30 to deal with...